Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Doug Scott, you, you may have seen him perform here before, or speak here before. Um, today, he's talking about the hard road to Everest. This is the story of his how he got there um, from a scout, you know, a young lad climbing on the black rocks of Derbyshire and the sort of incremental steps he took that developed his confidence and his ability um, through climbing, uh, you know, big walls and climbing all over the world and finally reaching the summit of Everest in 1975, Dougal Haston. Please welcome Doug Scott. Uh, well, it goes back a long way for me. Uh, my father was um, a boxer. Uh, in, became British European police champion and army champion and then British heavyweight champion but um, amateur he, he would make things in his spare time in the workshop and bring them home toys made of wood and one thing he brought was a sheet of plywood and on it he um, wrote for when the one great scorer comes to write against your name he writes not what you won or lost, but how you played the game. So I wanted to keep as amateur as possible, as amateur as my father was. Všechny statistiky, které jsem přebíral, byly hlavně časopisu Climbing, kam tak Scott psal, dalo by se říct, mimo himalajském ledení, to byl takový hlavní můj informátor. Co pro mě představuje vlastně Doug Scott, tohle z toho jméno, jo. to bylo pro mě vždycky symbolem a synonymem něco jako, já nevím, byla třeba uh, Libuše, to znamená něco, co vlastně neexistuje, je takový éterický, ne, on je z masa a kostí, je to velice příjemný, přirozený člověk, který mi, uh, když už jsem měl pak šanci i potkat, vlastně naplnil veškerou tu moji představu toho opravdu borce z té klasické anglické horozecké školy. Přesto my máme pocit, že je to nějaká prahistorie, dávnost a že ty kluci jako prostě byli nějaký samozřejmě nějaký zpomalenější, nebo nějaký máme pocit jako takového toho zpomalenějšího filmu, jo, černobílýho debák, oni už byli tenkrát strašně dobrý a, a myslím si, že teprve teďka dobíháme spou ve spoustu momentech tu, tu jejich dovednost a divíme se, co byli vlastně schopní udělat nejenom s vybavením, jo, ale vůbec tou myšlenkou, jo. Kam už vlastně tenkrát tu myšlenku dokázali dotáhnout? On je pro mě nějaký symbol toho, toho pojetí v tom horolezectví, lezení ve velkých horách, ve velkých stěnách. 
takhle to má vypadat. Prostě uvolněnost a nějaká, uh, nějaký takový ten trošku pankácký styl přístupu k věci, uh, to mi bylo vždycky blízký a, a já jsem si to vlastně přenesl uh, díky nim i do toho svého vlastně osobního života. Pak ještě by bylo hrozně sympatický, že vlastně já jsem se tak trošku nechtěně pustila do toho bafuňaření. A tak vlastně kromě toho, že, že takhle les a, a že měl takovýhle, byl takový vizionář v tom e, vysokohorském lezení, tak se i angažoval takhle, že vlastně on byl, myslím, zakladatelem Climbers Clubu v Británii, pak byl určitě místo předseda BNC nějaký čas. No a jak jsem si ho tady takhle hezky umístila, tak e, se na mě tak kouká, Přísně, že nelehej si na ten gauč, běž ven, běž líst, nebuď líná. This is the first time anyone's been above, uh, anyone's got a camp six in and is operating above the rock band. So it's all looking a bit hopeful, except we didn't get here till four, which is a bit late. Being four o'clock, we stopped there for a afternoon tea uh, here, Put, scooped a little hollow in the snow and uh, had a brew, melted, melted the snow with a, our little gas stove and carried on along this frontier ridge, which it is, between Nepal, all in the light, and significantly all in darkness, Tibet, where such horrible things have happened to the Tibetan people since the Chinese so-called liberated the country. Immediately caused the death of uh, 1.3 million, destroyed 6,000 monasteries, and the oppression continues. All kinds of horrible things happen all the time. And nobody's bothered that much because of the Chinese have got, become our main trading partner. Anyway, uh, here we are on the summit, finally, after three expeditions. Very happy to be there. I must say it was a, a unique moment in our lives and just feeling part of something much bigger than ourselves going off here. Him and me and great nature and nothing else.
when, when the sun finally went, we thought we'd better go. And uh, headed off down, got down the Hillary Step in the dark. Head torches failed. Stumbled on a bit. Wind had blown snow into the tracks. So in, in the end, we decided to sleep here where we had the brew on the way up. We dug into the snowbank and sat our rucksacks then for the next uh, nine hours. Bitterly cold. Um, I, I carried on digging the cave just to keep warm. You could have got five people in there by dawn. But strange things did happen there. Dougal starts to have a long and involved conversation as if Dave Clark's with us. Our equipment officer, they were discussing the relative merits of various sleeping bags. Obviously not having a sleeping bag was very much on Dougal's mind. Uh, and I thought he was losing the plot till I realised I'd been in, in and out of conversations with my feet. I'd been, I said to the right one, what are we going to do with the left one? It's just not warming up. And the left one replied. Like, there were like two, ex, two entities in the cave with us. A very significant thing, this, this bivouac, for me, to survive it without a sleeping bag, without oxygen. My, my oxygen ran out on the summit, so I had uh, a good nine hours up here without oxygen. And uh, we emerged and got down without, as it happened, frostbite. So I certainly knew I would never need to bother with oxygen bottles again. Sartorial elegance. I think we proved on Everest in 1975, um, finally, that you can climb a steep face like the southwest face of Everest uh, if you employ enough people, experienced people. You have a good leader, as we had, Chris Bonington. If you're well organised and uh, you're taking oxygen and you use fixed ropes, then you can more or less guarantee climbing anything. Well, if this uncertainty as to the outcome is the key, what is the point of doing that again? Because you know you can do it. Obviously, for a real adventure, for a real kind of uh, memorable experience, and to do justice to the mountain, the only real way to climb is alpine style. I met, I met Doug Scott uh, much before going on Makalu together. And I had generally always great respect of the British um, mountaineering style. We are very close, and this generation, Doug's generation, they are key figures, especially in the storytelling about the mountains, not only in doing. It's at least as important the narrative about traditional mountaineering than the activity itself. And I estimate his social work like I am still fascinated by his climbing uh, work done all over the world, especially what he did on Ogre is really great alpinism, traditional alpinism. And we should be careful on bringing to the next generations the narrative that uh, traditional mountaineering would not finish because in the moment, most of the climbers, they climb indoor. The, the pista alpinism is winning. There are more people uh, going in this direction and always less, less, less people going like the mountaineers before us on traditional uh, mountaineering um, activities. Yeah, climbing is about accepting the rock medium as you find it. Whether it's limestone, granite, grit, whatever it is, uh, without changing it. And to 
protect your own life as you climb it. That's the ultimate adventure you can have on the rock.